Leo's quite right. Lima's pretty intense. And I didn't think anybody needed a master class in Lima. So I separated it out kind of as centering on its primary focus, primary, like what it was originally intended for, which was the linear model and applying that to like multiple uh, genes. And so I, let me, let me share. Uh, so I've kind of, like, uh, So I've kind of separated into what I want to say two main sections where I just talk about the linear model part of just linear models in, in R and then how Lima kind of expands upon it and like the the, the, the best little bits of Lima. Uh, there, there's a lot to go around, but the, the things that I picked out for using and then a little bit of extra stuff. And so if you did, uh, uh, have time to install that last one, one two one pipeline. Uh, that that I like a lot, and Leo suggested it, and I was like, this is the exact one that I use the most. And so, if you're thinking about like doing this on your own, like I would definitely uh, follow the the bioconductor tutorial. Here. The the links provided in the that that. It's like, it takes everything you need to know uh, from the get-go and you can kind of add things here and there at the, like the first parts of the differential expression or some small changes, but like it's, it's on top of that. And then for everything you kind of need to know, I found this cool workshop where they have everything online, uh, linear models in R and this tutorial. And I've taken several sections from here and from 201 here that I thought was most appropriate for like kind of what we do and what Leo does and what people in Jaffe's lab do a lot with Lima and uh, and kind of how we're using it here at, at Lieber. So if anybody has any questions or wants to comment, please go ahead and stop. Uh, I, I sent you the code so that you can pull up R and run it yourself, um, the R Studio, and you could just copy it and paste. Uh, if you did want to do that tutorial for linear models, I've also included a link um, in, in, the, in the documents for downloading all of the data. We don't need it for this, which is why I didn't ask you guys to download any data. Uh, so, cool. Uh, so, the, I hope you guys installed the required packages here. Is it, this is the note. This, these slides are literally just my Jupyter notes. And so it's like an R markdown that if you guys talk to me, uh, we're here last time, uh, just made into slides. So acquired packages is pretty simple. We're just looking at uh, Lima and then the, the tutorial, which installed a lot of packages. Uh, so it took a little while. And so if you're loading things in on yourself, just so you can follow along, we don't use it all at the moment, but this mouse uh, annotation is use, is going to be needed in the second part of this, and then the R, edge R is going to be needed too. So, so what is Lima? Like the, the, the main and the very first publication was its introduction to microarrays. So it dates itself in the title, it, it was originally made for microarrays and it has been expanded for RNA sequencing, obviously, otherwise we wouldn't be talking it, about it today. And it's got a bunch of other cool functions that it's been expanded on that uh, Leo hinted about and I'll probably talk about a handful, at least two of those, but there are more, much more. And so I've just added like the, the vignette for it. So the user guide that is some 200 pages. Although a lot of our documentation is 200 or more pages. Uh, I've read a bunch and it's not underwhelming. It's just about standard for the big intensity ones. And then just the documentation. And then I just took this out of here because out of their page, because I thought it, it really explained the purpose and why they have it. It's, it's for analyzing gene expression and applying linear models to them. And I, I'm hoping that the, the way I presented this pub, uh, 
this uh this kind of uh, slides will kind of show you like the how novel and how useful and how the variables kind of fit to to make uh, Lima easier for applying so many models to like tens of thousands of genes. Okay, so this is just my telling you the first step, the that tutorial I linked before. Uh, I'm just going to start out with a simple linear model. So not Lima, let's really get some down to very simple stuff that's like, it's technically machine learning, uh, uh, but it's like very accessible and anybody can do it. And this is a continuous predictor. So this is an example data uh, that you can just copy and paste from the, the code. It's just got age and height and you're going to predict if you, if you just plot them, you know, predict height from age, uh, you, you can see there's a linear, uh, a nice straight line, uh, which you probably wouldn't see all the time, but it's still very nice. Uh, from At least from nine to 21, that's probably true. Uh, I'm not gonna say anything about getting older or about how this is not true for everybody, uh, but uh, yes, in general, you get this nice linear. So when they fit the model and I don't, know how familiar everybody is with linear algebra, the y is height here. So if we want to just transfer this height, this tilde plus one plus age, this is R's kind of special formula notation where it's really uh, height equals uh, an intercept. So like beta plus uh, your variable age, which normally has a coefficient. And then if you're looking at the coefficients, you got your intercept, which is just the one coefficient for the intercept and then your coefficient for your age. So if age is a, is just a simple, like straight line kind of uh, linear model. Is everybody following? Yes. And here, uh, uh, the R and this kind of linear model function, they give you the option to either add one or don't put it at all, and you automatically add a, an intercept. You can take it away by putting zero uh, or minus one. Uh, and sometimes it's useful to do it, but it's more like per personal preference and kind of what you're trying to do and how easy and how readable you want to do it. With. So it's, it's literally the same thing whether they have one or, or no one. And here's when you want to take it off. So you no longer have the intercept uh, or a separate variable for intercept. It, it really just depends on kind of how you're feeling and stuff like that. And from here, you can extract the coefficients too. And I've used, this is a base function. I've used this with Lima to do some regression analysis. So some residualization. I find that these small things where you, you have your linear model and you can grab the coefficients, then you can do all kinds of stuff with it. And so you see the printout tells you the coefficients. It's the exact same ones here when you're using coefficients. Uh, so the thing that's kind of different between Lima and these regular linear models is that in the regular linear models, it R just kind of don't makes this matrix of predictors or your design matrix for you. While in Lima, you have to specify. And so if you were to examine that fitted model, you'll see that this is the design matrix or the matrix of predictor that it has here. And you can make that yourself with doing model matrix here and it will be the exact same thing. And we use that all the time for when we're, we're uh, making our, our, our design matrices. Now, that was a simple linear model. I, I have time to stop here to make sure we, we're all on the, the same, same page. You can predict from this. Uh, now you've fitted it, you can look at uh, the QQ norm. You can do all kinds of stuff because uh, it is the low key machine learning. So now you all know machine learning. Uh, uh, for uh, things that we kind of do more uh, using a, a variable factor. So if you're trying to, to get like schizophrenia or control or some other kind of thing like that, 
we're going to be using more of a, a, a group and a outcome kind of thing. And if you have multiple things, then you're going to be looking at an F test. If it's just the two comparisons, so like just schizophrenia control versus schizophrenia control and bipolar, then, then you're going to look at a T test. And I'll, I'll explain that more if you have questions, especially when you're looking at the lean output. So again, I've applied some like some training data that you can use to just play around with it. And you can see that they've got this kind of nice grouping. Obviously, it's fake data. Uh, and when you fit it, you use the same thing. This is very nice uh, where it will automatically convert as long as you have it as a factor, uh, your, your variables and you don't have to tell it, oh, I'm doing a logistic regression versus I'm doing a linear regression because this, this you've gone from, technically this is now a logistic regression while the other one is a linear regression. It's the exact same, uh, exact same format, exact same uh, function. You don't have to do anything on that. You don't even have to really consider the difference between whether you're putting what functions you have to use, whether you're using a categorical data or a continuous data. Uh, so one thing to look at, and I've had uh, people in my lab ask a lot, is when they're doing things that have more than two comparisons. Before, it, if this was just one comparison, you'd have this one group that said, would say one group and it, you wouldn't have all these extra things. Because there's three different uh, comparisons, you have a group A and a group B, uh, which is being co contrast against control. And those are based off of how they come normally alphabetically, uh, just because of how factors are, are uh, labeled, which you can rearrange if you need to. But if you're wondering, oh, what does this mean? Uh, it, it is technically a conversion from your three levels to a hot encode. So that just makes it pairwise and it's necessary for when you're kind of doing these comparisons and in any kind of machine learning. So you can do hot encodes for neural networks and when you do it for linear models, it's the exact same, same thing. Uh, where the first level and in R, it's normally alphabetical unless you told it, told it something else. So be wary if you have like bipolar control and schizophrenia, bipolar is going to be that first level. You'll need to manually change it. And here, it literally is comparing control to group A or control to group B. And you have to really understand the model matrices you're doing because if you, you put kind of junk into any kind of software, you're going to get junk out if you don't understand the comparison. This is very important for if you're doing like a brain region comparison, things you can do with the LIBA data sets, or if you're, again, doing multiple uh, primary diagnosis comparisons, you do in one setting, you do need to make sure you are understanding what the comparison is. And so that's pretty much a, my, I'm off my soapbox now, okay. So that, that's pretty much it for the linear model stuff. I don't, how many people, if you could just put like in the chat, already know about linear models uh, and have used them in our, I have to exit my share. Yeah, yes, no. I have used the linear models. You have not used the linear model. Okay. Once or twice. Mm -hmm. and in Python, are you using Skitlearn? Skitlearn? Uh, are you using something else for linear models? Yeah, I've used Scikit-Learn. Um, Scikit-Learn. I did. I've done like. I did a lot of work with some logistic stuff or regression and then a little bit with linear. So curious to see how that transfers to, to R here. Yeah. So there's a, I'm trying to convert some, uh, the Lima function specifically because it does these very nice things with weights to a psychic learn. It is not easy. Uh, the things that the code has done in R intuitively is quite impressive uh, when you're looking at it. And, and again, the 
like you people don't even need to know the difference between uh, logistic regression and linear regression when they're using uh, linear models in R because like, it's the exact same function. You just need to make sure you're using a factor and not a string um, for doing category data or logistic regression. Okay, so we have a couple of people have used it a few times, some on a basic level, that's good. Um, I, I think that first, my first kind of introduction to this in R was uh, some mouse data in grad school. Uh, so it's very, I was just trying to look for a trend. Uh, so especially for this kind of thing, uh, I know that a lot, this is very accessible for at least basic sciences. And I, I encourage you guys to, to, uh, to, to use it if you can, especially if you want to do your own like a one way ANOVA, uh, do, a, a, do an ANOVA uh, in R. The linear model is part of that. Uh, so that's cool. I'm very much speeding through this mostly because it's like, uh, you know, uh, it's very actually hard to both run the code and share my screen. At least when Leo's running these things, I, I have a hard time uh, doing both. So now that I have laid the framework for just like what the basic thing with the linear model is, one couple of notes that I want to keep in mind is that th the linear model that is like the basis for R will do one thing at a time. So you're either looking at height and one height and a bunch of parameters. So if you, you're thinking of the age, you can think that of that as like age, sex, a uh, RIN, uh, any kind of RNA quality stuff. And you're looking at exactly one thing, one predictor. Uh, the, the, the cool thing about Lima is that this is now expanding it from doing like one model to like tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands. I've managed to do this on the junction. We've done this, and I even know that you know, Jaffe Lab has done this on junctions, which is we're talking hundreds of thousands. And it doesn't take too much more time. I mean, it does take time, but not that much more time. So I'm just going to move into the second part which is like focusing on that, that the beauty of Lima. Or Lima. I think how to pronounce that. Is it Lima or Lima? Uh, it bothers me only sometimes. So first things first and some like caveats um, if you want to run any of the like just want to run the 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 linear fit model for lima it needs to be in a particular object and that's for that's for specific reasons on how it, it uh, will expand uh, the model to all of the genes so it doesn't necessarily have to be a de gene list but it has to be one of these specific kind of lists and if you if you do um, the LM question mark LM fit with the for the linear model for Lima. Oh, I can just do that now. So if you do question mark LM fit, you'll, you'll see that it, it has to be one of these particular objects, like, um, it's not the best description. There's a handful of them. When I, I did this kind of bunny hop where I went from what, what is a git ewu to what is a, uh, in the, uh, uh, the liter, their, um, how do you, their documentation. There's a handful of them, so it can be uh, there's a handful of these objects, and I, I'm blanking on the names because some of them are like these random things that don't quite make sense, but they're either associated with Lima or they're associated with an edge R object. I'm not sure if it's a, if you can use de seek objects, but I'm sure you could probably convert it to one of those objects that Lima then, then would recognize. It's a, one of those caveats that I found out the hard way. Okay. 
and so the first thing you do is if you're using summarize uh, summarize experiment, then you can you already have most of everything you need. You have your samples, you have your counts, and you have any kind of metadata you might want. So the phenotypes covariance, you can convert all that uh, normally into a DE gene list, and then you'll want to normalize it. Although uh, some some depending on less if you're using Voom or not, Voom will normalize it, but you probably should normalize it regardless and then also filter out low reads. And that's quite important before you do your differential uh, expression analysis to make sure you filtered out enough reads. Uh, otherwise it, it messes up with the, the algorithm. So like if you're doing this with me, uh, which might be hard, uh, you can just run this script and it downloads some very lightweight. It's not, it doesn't seem to be a lot. Uh, at least it was very fast for me. Uh, samples, so you can practice on some real test data. Uh, trying to do download one of um, uh, the the uh, like a phase two stuff can be a lot. Some of those things are this is so much in there. It's quite intensive. But I would encourage you to like use the summarize range and fiddle with it so that you can download uh, one of the brain seek stuff maybe dorsal prefrontal cortex and then try to run the differential expression and see if you get the same same numbers as as uh, as leo um, so if you have like the count files which is what this will do it it, it uh, this is going to get you a bunch of count files so like if you if you're using publicly available data and they have count files and all this. You can then just download them all if a location with this DM read and then it will make it into a DM class. Normally you're going to want to just convert it into this class by putting counts, samples, and genes all in one uh, object, but you'll get the same thing as an output. And then this is just kind of how looking at what that size is. Uh, you can either put the sample information in there uh, when you create your list, or if you're doing the DM read, you just add it after the fact. Uh, normally, it's stored in this X sample, and you just put in the information. And you can make up whatever you want, just it's just like making a new uh, column, uh, the same syntax in, in R, which is either the dollar sign or brackets. Uh, so again, if you're doing this, you do need to make sure you have the mouse, uh, this mouse data here so that it will work. Um, for our stuff, you, they have an exact thing on Bioconductor for humans. It's the latest annotation and you can get either do that or you can get the bio, bio R. Otherwise, you can do some other stuff where you can just import the annotation from like a GTF file. There's a little bit more work about that uh, for parsing. So I, I kind of recommend using these pre-built annotations unless you're on like Python. Uh, the Python has a biomart, but it also has a, a GTF parse function. Uh, so that'll also be useful. Right. And, and this is just looking at, at what they're doing here and an example of how they, you know, loaded in this and then selected for a handful of columns and you, you can pick however many you want. and just uh, making sure you clean it up, make sure you don't have duplicates. So I, what I was saying uh, before is that it will, this uh, DE gene list kind of has three main components, the samples, which is like the phenotype data. This is where you're gonna have your covariance, like age and primary diagnosis and stuff, the counts, the raw counts, and then the genes. You know, gene annotations, all of this would be in a summarized experiment if you're getting that from uh, from the Jaffe lab, or you can piece it together uh, if you're using publicly available data just by uh, just by uh, doing each individual like in this kind of tutorial. And from here, then you can like normalize uh, with uh, counts per million. Uh, and normally you will do a log normalization there there you can do either one but uh, log normalization is likely the one you want to go with because it'll help with express 
keeping the expression differences similar. So like you have some really, really high expression genes and you have some low expression genes, you're more likely to pick out uh, those low expression genes, differential uh, differences in the low expression genes as, uh, so they don't get like boxed out by the high ones. And so for here, uh, you definitely, you got, you have to remove the low expression genes, at least if you're doing the differential expression here with Lima. Lima. And this is just kind of looking at how many have exactly, how many of these genes have zero reads in all of the, the samples provided. And uh, that's, that's actually quite a bit, like 5,000. Uh, so always take a look at your, your data. Um, if you've done it, someone else has done it, it's always important to, to take a look and make sure you get rid of them. Um, I personally like using filter by expression just because it uses some, uh, which is an edge R function. It uses some basic, uh, basic uh, library sizes and like uh, percentages based off of uh, uh, the millions, uh, normalized for counts per million. So in general, uh, it's going to filter based off of the smallest sample size. So if you have, if you don't have perfect sample sizes, like especially like what we have in the, for the brain seeks where you might have 60, 40, uh, it'll use the 40% and to as your minimum sample size and and drop those reads based off of that so uh, this is just the default function you can play around with it it could more of what i was kind of saying it drops the 10 reads and a minimum number of samples and it, it uses your group information uh, and then the, the Jaffe Lab, they have this express cutoff. I'm not familiar with it because I haven't used it. I do know somebody, Tarun, who is an older master student in our lab, used it uh, for expression cutoff. Uh, but if you are interested, I'm sure you could probably contact Leo or anybody else with the Jaffe Lab who's been using it. Uh, and then if, if you have used it, go ahead and say it in the chat so that people can contact you if they want to know more uh, as, as an alternative. So here's kind of like a look at what, what it would be like if you don't filter versus filtering. And this is just code. Uh, so here's the raw. You've got all of these in your distribution uh, if you don't filter versus if you filter it, you get a better, smoother, normal distribution. It's important because this, this, the software um, is considering a normal distribution, and if you have a non-normal distribution, it, it's not going to be accurate. So those are just, especially for, for Lima uh, or Lima. I don't know how many times I'm going to say that differently. So uh, I normal, uh, you also want to normalize by the uh, library size. Uh, so you've got different sizes uh, of libraries for all of these different things. So you, you'll want to normalize it. And the default is T, TMN, at least in edge R. Uh, and then I thought this was kind of cool to look at, uh, just kind of show you what happens if you don't normalize by the library size versus if you did. It's quite different. You, you want to see something straight like an ND. So, that. Now, the great. As I mentioned before, you, you definitely, ha you'll have to make your design matrix outside before putting it in the, the linear model. This is one of the, the extra bits, which I think is appropriate for, for Lima versus just a regular linear model in R. Uh, here they're cleaning it up and you've got just the kind of a look at all the nine samples and you've got these extra bits here for lane. So this is where you would consider your, your bias. So if we're thinking here, the group, that would be like primary diagnosis and then lane could be lane if you have that information or it could be age or some type of covariant. Uh, for this example, if you might have noticed, they use zero, and, and that's because they it's easier here because you have to look at the to do comparisons in the contrast matrix. So, 
for example, uh, if you want to, you are specifically saying you're, you're looking at samples that have basal versus this LP, and you want to look at the basal versus ML. So you can do your pairwise sample levels quite easily uh, stated, and you know exactly what you're putting. Uh, it's easier to read, um, but it's also easier in your head to make sure you're doing the right thing. And here, these are zeroed out, which is great because you know that's going to be zeroed out in your, uh, it's going to attempt to correct for this kind of bias. So that's, that's what the zeros are kind of saying. Oh, and I thought nice key takeaway that I was, I found when I was looking up for preparing for this talk was just like the strengths, you know, is the flexibility of that design matrix. You can add all your covariates in there. You can do some very in, like interaction. Uh, you can put interaction models in there. Uh, it's still linear algebra. So it does have the caveat that you can't do nonlinear uh, approaches, but it's still quite intense in complexity in the model. And it, you don't have to write it 10,000 times. You write it once and Lima, Lima will then uh, uh, duplicate that or propagate that for each of the genes. Uh, so I'll talk briefly about the duplicate correlation because uh, you can also do correlations a bit later. Good. Okay, so one, Voom, which does have its own paper, I think it actually has two papers uh, because they added another function. It is very, 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 very useful, especially for human data, uh, which has this heterozygosity, I can't say that, but I don't even try. But you know, it's people, people are, are not mice isogenic lines. So you've got these, uh, this variance in there that you just, I mean, there's nothing you can do unless you manage, you're doing, working with some very far isolated population that has been inbreeding for forever. Uh, so Zoom is very useful. Uh, you probably don't need it so much for mouse lines since if they're isogenic, unless you're. But for human data, it's it's a uh, it's very great. It's a uh, uh, ten out of ten for me. Uh, this is just kind of a look at it, and I'm going to talk. A, spend a little bit of time on the graph here. If you see this for the room, uh, room mean variance trend. Here at the zero to five, this, this left-hand side of the graph, if your curve is going a little down and if it goes down, then up, then down again, you need to filter out more. Uh, so adjust your filter. Um, that, that's a, if you don't do that, you're, you're not having a very accurate count. So if you see that in the graph, so it's very important to plot it at least once when you're troubleshooting your, your script, you, you, need, you need to, to filter more. And you can see after you've applied Voom, like you get pretty much zero variances, variance uh, when you're looking at it, or not zero, but it's not, it doesn't have a, this curve. Uh, I always expect, inspect the, the variables when they've made it just because sometimes I don't bother reading all of the documentation uh, for, for Lima or especially Voom. Uh, it's quite similar to pretty much uh, the edge R variable where you have genes, which is your annotation. The design matrix, that's what you put in. So it's storing this. Uh, this E here is the ex normalized expression. So this is CPM plus about 0.05 log two CPM, and then a little bit of a constant. And then the targets, this is gonna, the targets are gonna be where your samples are now. Uh, so the sample information, which included the covariance and stuff. And then more importantly, it's the weights that were used for getting, to, for um, regressing out that variance. Uh, this is very useful if you want to utilize Voom for any like uh, residualizing out data for yourself. So if you want to do 
some extra work or some extra uh, cleaning data or you want to use uh, some linear models and stuff or nonlinear models, you want to extract the key components, which would be uh, expression and the weights and the targets, and then pop that into some like a neural network or a random forest. You can do that from here, uh, as long as you factor in uh, that this has been residualized. And so we, we use that a lot actually in our own work, uh, our machine learning work. Yep, ask me about it later. So the linear fit. This is, if you're Googling this, uh, uh, LM capital F IT, you will get a bunch of different things for R because it doesn't always keep the capital F. Uh, just know that you're looking for the Lima and you, you should be fine. Uh, this is the actual thing that's going to fit it. And in putting it now, it's literally, it's pretty much the same. And in fact, it calls the, the LM series depending on what's in your input variable. Uh, so you've got your expression so it's got both the uh, target your which are your different genes and then it's got your samples uh, for sample size and it's got uh, all those things I showed you before and then the model which is telling it how to perform the linear regression uh, well the not the linear the the linear fit the contrast fit uh, that's very useful when you're doing multiple things. If you're doing control versus schizophrenia, it's not so necessary, but if you need to do uh, the three groups or some other things, adding the contrast matrix here just fits it so you can identify the, the different comparisons. And this is the actual statistical test. So these all come within the Lima software where if you just want to get a quick look to see your comparisons, uh, you can see what you're up, what you're down, and how many are non-significant, and it's got all of the pairings. And this will do this whether as long this is from your contract contrast matrix. So the label you put here in the contract, the label you see here is directly from the contrast matrix. If you don't contrast matrix, you're probably going to get something generic. Uh, so labeling is key, especially if you want to look after the fact what's happening. Uh, and then it's done the statistics for you. So like, how do you extract the significance? Uh, I, you, top table is like the thing to use. Uh, you'll see that if you just do top table in your uh, statistically fit uh, linear model here, it'll show you these are the gene annotations you put. So if you add like all kinds of things like uh, start and stop, or like some type of description, this will all be here before you get to each individual, um, I think, uh, a sample. I don't remember what this is, but I think it might be expression. Uh, and then it'll tell you, give you an F statistic, uh, a p-value, and adjust the p-value. Uh, because this is an F statistic, this is pretty much giving you an ANOVA. So as they're asking is, if any one of these three comparisons are different, uh, differentially expressed. It, it's, uh, a caveat is that it, no matter what you do, if you say it here, it's 10 by 10, it, you're gonna just get the top 10. Um, here, if you want more, then you just need to change the adjust the number here and uh, you can sort uh, by whatever you'd like I, I normally sort by p so uh, if you notice i added coefficient equals one which is not in the first one and instead of the f now you're looking at a t uh it you probably guess uh but the coefficient one is associated with the very first contrast so in this regards, it'll be this basal versus LP. So the order you add your contrast will be the order that the coefficients are also in. Uh, 
So if you want to play with that, you can probably you can do coefficient two and coefficient three to get the individual comparison. So this is your pairwise analysis, and, and it'll give you the log flow change and the same stuff. Except now you got a t statistic. So just as I was like, this is normally where I would stop and suggest you guys play with the coefficients to see uh, what the difference is, uh, but I've already given the ghosts away. <laughs> so uh, I'll probably just uh, uh, continue and then we can discuss more after if you have any other questions. So, so this, uh, this variable has a lot in it. Uh, it'll have both a T and an F statistic. Uh, they're telling us different things. Uh, and then it'll have all the contrast. It has pretty much everything you need to know about what went into this this model, including these cool little this p values. And I, I saw one of my colleagues use this where he saved the p values to a file. Um, you would probably want to replace these row names with some actually informative row names. Uh, but outside of that, I thought is very uh, useful thing to just like save all your p-values because then you can use uh, any kind of p-adjust software to adjust them and then you've got everything you, you want if you're doing like a time series or uh, uh, you're grouping ages for uh, some type of neural development. And then you know you want, might want to look at it. Uh, Lima includes this volcano plot feature so here and you can do some individual highlighting. Uh, it will label like each one of these though and I kind of prefer uh, adjusting by p-value and log flow change so I just I think I copied this script from online somewhere from one of the stack help uh, the difference here is and normally what I do for saving all my data is I put number equals infinity uh, into a top tape from top table and you can extract everything from that one coefficient and then write that to a file. Uh, and then if you wanted to look at the uh, MA plot or MB plot, uh, it's also here. Be careful because the plot MA in Lima is for microRNAs, uh, it's for microarrays. Uh, so if you want that that plot that's got the highlighting and stuff, you, you need to either, you know, point at your, use a, a hand script or, or use the MD. Not MDS, M MD. MDS will give you something else. And uh, pretty cool. Uh, it does have some limited uh, Venn diagrams. So here's that, uh, the, uh, it's, the side test again, which gives you a snapshot of up and down regulated stuff. I'm just showing you it again. And then it'll plot it here. Uh, tell you the, the things that are together, things that are separate. Uh, probably need to switch the coefficients to get the other ones, but uh, it's, it's got some limits, uh, some utility. So this duplicate correlation, which is probably another paper, uh, is quite impressive and very useful, especially for our data set, which has several different brain regions from the same sample. So if you, for example, if you're doing something where you want to look at all the brain regions together, some differential expression, you do need to account for the fact that there are some of these samples are from the same people. So you would just... Uh, create a block and use this duplicate, cor uh, duplicate correlation. A as that stuff takes a very, very long time to run, if you're doing like all of the adult samples or something, I just got this uh, test data, sim sim um, sim simulated data. It's for microarrays, but it, it's, it shows you what's going on regardless. I right, we got these two groups. Uh, and the first thing is you create your blocks. So for us, example, if you're using, if you want to use our brains and you want to do it for 
multiple uh, tissues and they have the same brain, or if you want to look at phase one and phase two and they have the same brain, you do need to create this block, which you would then put like the brain ideas, ID numbers converted to uh, numbers or symbols so that they uh, have like a grouping. So it's from, you know, which individual it's from. And then you just use this dupe correlation function. So this Y, uh, that's where you're going to put your, that's for, for Lima, that's normally where you're going to have uh, your expression. And you can literally just put your, your uh, like Voom variable in there. And then the design matrix uh, and then the block. So this is the same design matrix you would have already used for the exact same pipeline. And then it'll give you this consistent, consensus correlation and this is this here is what you use for putting it into either voom uh because you can put it you want to put it into voom before you then put the voom variable into lima uh this linear fit and then it's got specific things for the block and the correlation and then you can fit it uh, same thing. It's just like one extra step and then just an extra kind of correlation. But the cool thing, and the, which is different between your regular linear model and this uh, limb fit from Lima, is that it automatically detects if you're using this correlation block. And if you use the correlation block, it switches from using a general linear model system to the G limb linear model system. So it, using the uh, slightly more intricate uh, interaction version. So, so this is just doing the same thing with and without the correlation. And I must have an error in my code somewhere. Ah, no, uh, it was showing you the difference. Uh, you, you do get a different results, whether you have incorporated the correlation or you haven't. So, uh, I, I, again, I talked about so like some of the pretty much, it's pretty much our workflow for when we're doing differential expression with uh, Lima and Voom. There are other things you can do with it. Um, so if you have like questions or something, you can let me know, but I don't have anything else uh, outside of that. So any questions or concern, I, I would like suggest like running it yourself. Uh, the tutorials are fantastic, uh, again, and they normally include data you can use. Uh, so that you can see it on a small subset of data before you jump into the much larger uh, uh, Lieber data set. Uh. Oh man, that's all I got. Uh, Yes, the, uh, the code here is in the Google Collab. You should be able to download that. Um, I have shared the code. It's in the, the Google Doc. That should have been there. Let me, uh, it's in this go the Google Doc. Uh, I put it in the group chat uh, underneath Leo's thing. So. And then there's also the code itself. You can download it or you can copy it and paste it into your R, R Studio because it is, a, it is an IPython notebook. Uh, um, technically, it's faster because it's doing 10,000. Uh, it's the difference between doing one gene and 10,000 genes. Uh, so it is faster. It does use LM though. So it's faster and it's input uh, the way that it, it runs all of them at once. 
So it does some some parallel working there. It uses a, a great deal of core. When I run it, it normally uses all of my available uh, core uh, threads. But the inner workings in it, it, it is using, it does call the LM. Uh, any other questions? Hi, Jade Kayon. The, does the boom operate a normalization too? Yes. Okay. It automatically does the normalization. So if you do normalization, it will then redo the normalization during Voom. Okay. But if I use Voom, I don't need to normalize uh, before, right? Uh, technically, no. Uh, yeah. Unless you want to look at stuff. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, any other? Any other questions? Thank you, Keenan. Thank you, everyone. Um, All right. Yeah. Um, see you next week. <laughs>